The other thing, I just had a piece out in Current History, which they sent me massive quantities of, uh, which is also on cosmopolitanism in the Gulf. So you're welcome to take one of these as well. Also, I, I, I have a PDF of those if, um, if they run out. <coughs> so uh, yeah, as, as Kyle mentioned, I am working on um, many different topics in the Arabian Peninsula. And one of the things that I've really enjoyed about working in, in Doha in particular is that I started working there in 2012, or started visiting there in 2012. And we all know what's going to happen in 2022, which is World Cup. FIFA World Cup, right? Um, so Qatar has been getting ready for the World Cup basically since they got the bid. Uh, the bid was announced um, as, as going to them in 2010. Uh, so this means that by the time when I started working there in 2012 to 2022, I'll be have have been observing all these transformations in Doha for about 10 years. Uh, and this is this is one of the pieces of that observation is sort of watching these uh, these smaller events as the country gets ready for the World Cup, uh, but also just seeing the transformation of the city over that time period. Okay. Oh, <laughs> that would be another presentation. Yeah, that, that we can uh, we can res reschedule that one. So um, I might I might come back to it again. But when we think about uh, geopolitics and sport in the Gulf, many people are often talking about uh, the World Cup in particular. Dan, you can help with this. Um, so many people today are talking about the World Cup, uh, and a lot of these conversations in academia are fixated on these large events in particular because this is uh, the first time that the World Cup will be going to the Middle East, to Qatar, uh, but also all of the sort of bribery scandals and other political scandals around it have attracted so many conversations. Uh, when we talk about sports in the Gulf, this, this tends to be um, the focus, but as you can already begin to tell, my interest is to say, let's go beyond that. Let's look not just in terms of the, the, the World Cup itself as an event, but also what other events are going on. The longer time scale of the preparation for the event uh, is really quite significant for understanding what's happening because most of this research, you tend to just have people parachute in, uh, observe the event for a week, and then move on with life. Um, so I want to think about this much deeper and much more broadly. Uh, and I do also think about this in other countries beyond Qatar, but these, these are the two that I have focused on um, in my other work and in the UAE and Bahrain as well. Uh, so Bahrain was actually one of the first to get going on this big international uh, sporting event thing, which developing uh, the Bahrain Formula One circuit. Not to be outdone, uh, the UAE quickly developed its own Formula One circuit, which is much, much nicer. Uh, and in fact, you can park, you can park your yacht here um, <laughs> and watch the Formula One races from there. So that's Yas circuit. Uh, and you know, in these these sorts of events, a big part of it is about sort of broadcasting this kind of modernity, but a sort of elite modernity where uh, you know Formula One is it's 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 relatively elite. Like it's not quite NASCAR. Um, but you know they, they also have on this same artificial island here in Abu Dhabi, they have Ferrari World, which is just kind of a glorified theme park. Um, they've had uh, the Volvo Ocean Race ending there uh, some years ago, which I also observed. <coughs> and obviously, uh, the World Cup in, in uh, Doha is a major focus of a lot of this attention. But some of the preparations that they have been uh, undertaking in Qatar in order to prepare for this, this particular event is hosting a number of smaller events, including the World uh, Cycling Championships, which happened in 2016, uh, which is what I will focus on today. Uh, but beyond that, there I'll come back to the Cycling World Championships, but there's been just tons of smaller events, or what I would call second-tier events, uh, that that you can see just just from some of these uh, these logos. Which I mean, if you maybe if you're a gym, if you're a gymnast, you're paying attention to this, um, or if you're a cyclist, you're paying attention to this. But m most of us aren't really uh, these aren't entering our radar. But for the Qatar Olympic Committee, these are all really quite important events that they take leadership on that they all sort of see as uh, the stepping stone for getting getting ready for uh, this next big event. 
One of the questions that people always want to know uh, or ask is why? Why are they doing this? Why are they hosting these large events? Uh, I could probably talk for many, many hours, many more hours than you would like to uh, about this, uh, about this question. But one of the stock answers to that why uh, has been, oh, it's just soft power. Um, it's just that the country is exerting its uh, influence internationally or trying to demonstrate its influence internationally uh, by deploying this, this nebulous thing called soft power. Um, I'm not sure that many of us in this room could actually define soft power if we were asked to, but it's really easy to just kind of like speak to it, reference it really quickly, and then you move on, right? Because it sounds like you know what it is. Well, it's not hard power, so uh, maybe it's just cultural influence, other, other sorts of things. So this becomes a really easy trope that people say, it's just soft power, it's just Qatar, it's, it's a small country, they have two million people, and they're trying to be influential in the international arena, um, and, well, they can't be because they're really small, and so it's just they're, they're trying to show off. That tends to be the dismissive narrative uh, of the soft power script, but you see that it comes out in all of these different headlines. Um, so to me, that is, as you can already gather, uh, rather mm, uh, unsatisfying. Um, and also, you know, it's, it's one thing to see it in the media, uh, but then also another thing to see how it enters academic discourse, because in a lot of sports studies literature, uh, there's this kind of uh, bandwagon effect around just explaining what's going on here through oh, well, it's soft power, and then again, you move on. Um, I want to understand what's actually working. Who's benefiting from this? Who is actually implementing these policies? Why are they doing it in a more tangible, concrete manner uh, than just a country doing something? Um, so that's, yes? Can you follow the budget for these uh, second, second tier events? Is it, is it opaque enough? To a minimal extent, but yeah, I mean, it, it's it's tricky in in particular for something like the world uh, the world cycling championships, which I'll talk about, where. There were, there were large fees paid to UCI, um, whether or not those were legal and whether that was the full extent of what Qatar paid to the U UCI, it's not entirely clear. So some of it, some of it you can trace and not all of it though. Um, so one of, one of the challenges I think with the soft power approach is that it tends to treat Qatar, this entity, as a thing as an actor that does things. Um, and if anybody has ever met me, you know that I, I like to rail against this kind of idea of statist language, of uh, just treating a country as an actor that can do things. Um, and to me, then the question is actually, well, who is Qatar? Like, who is actually making these, these decisions? When we say Qatar is exerting its soft power by doing X, Y, or Z, well, who's involved in that? Who's claiming the name of the state? Um, and what is Qatar? How, how are we imagining this as a territorially bounded entity? Um, I have some supplemental slides, not in the main presentation, but about the sports <coughs> sponsorship uh, internationally of European teams, for example. Uh, there, there is money flowing outward from Qatar to go into European clubs uh, and all sorts of other flows that extend well beyond this little sort of delineated territory right here. Uh, so to, to get beyond the soft power research, I think you have to get beyond the statist thinking that that is somehow a sufficient way of understanding geopolitics of just thinking about uh, states as actors. Uh, so the, the challenge of statist thinking is, is quite pervasive in in the uh, media and you know the the language of a country doing something is is quite typical in the media but again when it comes to scholarly analyses i think we can do better than that um, and i think that we should do better than that so to get beyond this idea of the state as an actor, uh, I'm thinking about this in, in, uh, this in this particular project of thinking about how you can approach geopolitics um, of sport through a set of encounters. And I'll give you some examples of what that looks like on the ground. Um, but in order to think of sport as a set of encounters um, that, that are kind of a geopolitics from the bottom up, I did uh, an event ethnography of the UCI World 
Road Cycling Championships, uh, which were in 2016. So in event ethnography, I'm happy to talk about this more at uh, maybe in the Q&A if, if people have questions about this, but basically participating in the in an event in a, uh, the fullest extent possible. Um, and how did I end up doing that? Well, let's see. I'm accustomed to studying certain uh, authoritarian governments, and so I heard that the cycling world championships were going to be in uh, Qatar, and I go immediately to the, the official website, and uh, we can create some space here, to the official, uh, the official website, and what is there on the official uh, Cuttery website for the event other than a selfie contest? <laughs> and I had, I, you know, I, I, I don't take selfies, I don't like selfies, <laughs> I don't really like social media in the first place. Um, so I saw this event, we, or this, this particular contest, where if you entered, if the, the top 30 entrants, uh, if you got the most likes on your particular photograph, uh, the top 30 people would get a free trip to uh, the, the, the event. And so, knowing Cutter as I do, and, and knowing how, how this was going to shake out, I thought to myself, 30 people are not going to enter. Um, so, knowing that... <laughs> I, I sort of I, I had I had some internal uh, dilemmas to deal with and then to think about you know the politics of accepting something like this if I were to enter, um, yeah. So let's just say in the end I decided to enter after lots of hemming and hawing, um, and my <laughs> lovely selfie taken in my office here uh, got lots of likes. <laughs> so, me and my own cycling, uh, cycling gear here. Uh, I don't, I don't remember the the, the exact number of, of people that ended up liking my photograph, but I got sent there. Uh, with these are some of the other selfie contest winners. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the back. Uh, they actually gave all of us these these shirts. They wanted us to wear them the entire time. I kind of refused that part of the ethnography. <laughs> uh, but the, the funny thing about this particular crowd and just sort of speaking to the selfie contest is that almost all the people in that picture are from Richmond, Virginia. <laughs> Does anybody know why they would be from Richmond? Anybody watch cycling? Okay, so world championships the year before in 2015 were in Richmond. So what the Cottery delegation had done is they had set up a, a, a tent, basically, at Richmond, at the Worlds there, and all these unsuspecting poor people walked by and <laughs> saw that they were running the selfie thing there in this tent in Richmond, and because, as I suspected, nobody entered, <laughs> they, they all won. Um, <laughs> so so <laughs> these, these, these brave souls got sent, sent to uh, sent to Cutter, and, you know, I'll, I'll come back to this in a little bit, but this is this is significant because most of these people had no idea even where Cutter was at that point in time, <laughs> and they were. They, this was the first time that they had been in the Middle East, uh, and so for many of them, they were bringing with them these stereotypical understandings of what the Middle East was, and uh, th those came those uh, ideas <coughs> came out in the conversations and the interactions at that particular event. Uh, there was a couple from South Africa. There was, uh, I think. Some a family from Holland as well, uh, so so this was part of my event ethnography. I mean, I also know a number of the women on the USA uh, the USA women's team. So I I spoke with them afterwards and during the event uh, about their experiences uh, as racers as well. So. Um, I am a cyclist, but not that good of a cyclist. So um, in, in thinking about then this experience and what I was attending to, I was basically trying to understand how, how the event was being used to script a particular kind of cuttery identity and who was doing that, who was picking up those stories and, and taking them about in and through this event. So the two sort of pieces that I focus on in, in the paper, and I'll just kind of briefly get into here, uh, two prevailing ideas that, that are really pushed through the story that they were trying to tell uh, through hosting this particular event. One is that Qatar is this leader in international sport, and not just you know a, a sort of local sport. And I, I have also, and I do research on heritage sport in the Gulf, so falconry, um, saluki, 
races, camel races, other things like this. Uh, so this is this is a different kind of sports scripting that you see uh, on focus on the globalized side. So they they, they coexist, um, but in in this particular case, because cycling is is known to be uh, or is, is understood to be a more global sport, that Qatar is a leader in this. Uh, but that also that the, the country itself is a tolerant place, that it is inclusive, that it is diverse, and that it is inclusive of gender identities and gender performances in the Middle East that are not just, you know, you must wear the abaya and you must cover, uh, but rather that this is a place where women can move about freely. Um, so this, these were the scripts. This is not to say that this is really uh, as, as things play out in the country, obviously in any place it's quite patchy, uh, but this is what they were trying to uh, trying to promote in the official language and in the official documents and all of the, the interactions and conversations I had with the Qatar Olympic Committee. Um, so both of these narratives, though, were really challenged from the from below. And by this, I mean the actual interactions of people uh, at the event. And so this is this is where I'm sort of thinking about geopolitics as a set of encounters from the bottom up. So how these these narratives of what Qatar is and how it fits in this sort of global configuration and in and through sport, uh, that these ideas are being challenged from, uh, from the actual interactions on the ground. So I'll start with the first one here of how that worked. Some of the challenges that you saw were largely related to um, the sighting of the the particular event. So, in order to portray, I'll just come back to this slide really fast. To uh, Cutter as as a leader in promoting this sport, that they wanted to do this in the most luxurious, best uh, locations that they could. So, the Pearl is a community here. Um, here's a seat here. Um, so the Pearl is this community here. It's an artificial island development. You've got lots of these in the Gulf. Um, it's one of the few places where foreigners can own the property. Uh, so it is basically um, an, an elite enclave of the foreign expats that live in Doha. Uh, so for anyone here, so I usually do this kind of caveat. So for anybody here who's not familiar with Qatar, 90% uh, of the population <coughs> are non-citizens. Uh, this means that they are expats. They will never, ever get citizenship. It's almost well, it's basically impossible. Um, so foreigners can't own property in much of the much of the country, and so it's only in these special communities where they can do that. And and the pearl is one of those. But many of these expats of that ninety percent of the country's population, they're all different class backgrounds, right? So this is where many of the the very wealthy expats will live. Are you the population yes. overall? Two point six million. Yeah. So that's quite small. And almost all of it, I think it's 90% is in Doha. Yeah. Um, so one of the challenges that you saw in the way that the, that the country and, and the organization committee was being critiqued for this particular event is that no one showed up. Um, and so this is, yeah, this is a, a question from one of the cycling uh, cycling reports or cycling news outlets, their reports, was what if, what if you held this championship and no one shows up? And literally this is what it looked like the vast majority of the time. Um, and I spent many, many hours at <laughs> this particular event. So you, you just have these massive uh, barricades and absolutely no one was on the island. Um, and the, this was also critiqued by some of the, the, the racers themselves. So Tony Martin from, from Germany was the winner of the, the team time. No, he was in winner of the individual time trial. Uh, and he, you know, it, at, when he was giving his comments after that victory, he was critiquing uh, the, the location, the choice of the location, and the Qatari uh, organizers for there being no one there. Um, and you can, you, you can imagine as a, when you're an elite athlete, you might be accustomed to a few more, uh, <laughs> few more people celebrating your victory with you. Uh, so Tony Martin very, very vocally critiqued this and this sort of <coughs> circulated very widely in the cycling community, uh, in all of the news coverage of, within the cycling press about this. Um, this was the constant thread of how empty it was. And you could also really see this from the helicopter 
footage, right, of how it was being broadcast to all the international audiences who were watching, all you're looking at is just barren, empty, empty um, uh, races. So this this is how most of the races ended. So the start line, well, the start finish line was. Um, actually, that's not right. Where is the finish line? Oh, it's here. Yeah, exactly. So um, many of the races, if they started somewhere else in the city, they might start here, but they'd have to come onto the Pearl Road, uh, this bridge here, and they would do these loops. Some of the races, so in this particular race, they just did loops around this, right? <coughs> they stayed exclusively on there. Um, but in any case, there would be multiple events in a particular day, this bridge right here is the only way on and off the island. Um, so this meant that this bridge was shut down uh, for 10 hours in a given day for 10 days. Um, so this made it very difficult actually to get to, uh, to the Pearl and off the Pearl. So one of the ways that, I mean, you, that, then again, you can see that in the, the crowds that, that were not there. Um, this is also one of the major uh, issues that I, I saw, at least in terms of the sighting of this, is that when you actually wanted to see the finish line is like right here, there's <coughs> This is all VIP tent. So the, the spectators can't actually like get there to watch it. Um, I, because of the, I was a selfie winner, <laughs> I had VIP access, um, but nobody else, the normal people couldn't actually see um, uh, the, the, uh, the races themselves at the finish line. They had some of these stands here as well, but as you can see, people were, well, it was quite hot. Um, mm -hmm. Even though they delayed it to October past the normal uh, timeline, so many people didn't necessarily want to be sitting out in the sun for a poor view. Uh, and, you know, some th this was pretty much the, the maximum crowd uh, that you saw. But you could sit in an air-conditioned tent instead and watch uh, the camera view of it just you know adjacent to to that particular finish line and you could actually get a decent view so even when there were some people here many others actually preferred to sit in the beanbag chairs and just watch it from inside <laughs> so you know this this contributes then to how this got critiqued and experienced on the television and the, the international reporting about this was oh it's just completely empty I mean it more or less was uh, but at the same time the way that it was set up uh, you had people kind of being encouraged to sit here and inside in this air-conditioned tent. Um, Excuse me, during, so, during yes. the race, did they have GoPro on, on some of the cyclists that you could see it from the cyclist uh, vision? I didn't look at any footage like that, but I'm sure that there was because there were there were all all races like at the junior level and, and up. So um, I'm pretty sure that there would be. I again, I didn't I didn't look for any GoPro. Sorry. Um, so the, the sort of coming back to this point here in this community and, and the cycling community in particular, it was just all of these examples, these planning failures were held up as a failure of the cutteries to really know how to deal with cycling. Um, that they are not, you know, critiquing them for, for trying to be a leader in globalized sport, but not really knowing how to do that uh, because they didn't really know cycling culture. And, and for anybody who does follow anything about cycling, you know that it's very Eurocentric. Um, Throw, throw some Colombian action in there, and really it's just Europe. Um, so this, this is a community that is extremely sort of, uh, has, has a strong sense of what is right and wrong about how an international cycling event should look. Uh, so this was being really <laughs> challenged in, in this reporting through, uh, through this particular configuration of the space of where they chose to highlight the modernity of the country through the pearl, but really the pearl was kind of the downfall of all of that. Um, so the second point of, of sort of using the event to broadcast Qatar as being modern and diverse and inclusive, you can sort of see this is the official discourse, right, through the, the phrasing of, of the mascot, um, Haz. So Haz was chosen because he, val he represents the many values we're trying to portray here, that he's brave, independent, gentle, um, that he represents peace, hope, and community. He is proud of his country, uh, loves his extended family, but respects all other creatures <coughs> who share his land. So this is a wonderful demonstration of the sort 
sort of cuttery version of cosmopolitanism, right? We have all of these values. These are, these are who we are as cutteries. Um, but we also have these other creatures that inhabit our land. Um, so we value them as well. So Chaz is, is the kind of embodiment of this, right? And so this is, this is the narrative that they're trying to promote. And I would say, you know, in, in studying all sorts of other representations of this discourse across Qatar, that this is, this is really um, the, the standard script, whether it's a museum or a new building um, or, or or what have you, a university. So uh, this, this script itself, though, was challenged through a number of things. Um, but they did try to promote this uh, through, through certain events attached to the cycling race. So one of the, one of the early critiques of having this event was it is just an elite event. And the Pearl residents, or the, the paper talks about the Pearl residents and their frustration. I, we'll skip that for now. I can talk about it later if you want. Um, but the, the idea that, in fact, this was just an ultra elite event that it wasn't catering to the masses, uh, that it had nothing to do with the ordinary people. Well, who are the ordinary people in Qatar? They are, as I said before, 90% non-citizens. Um, so they, the, the organizers, the Olympic Committee, figured out after some time, I would say, about a, mm, it was about a month before uh, the event that they figured out they should add a mass event um, to help get people feeling a little bit more included in this. Uh, so you could go, it was like a... a the, the last Saturday, at the Saturday or the last day of the event, um, you could participate in this ride of champions where there was, you know, just anybody could go out and ride the courses that the elite cyclists were racing. And this was really broadcast through the, um, uh, the, the company that was doing all the PR, all the, the promotional materials. They, they focused on this because it was one of the few things where you actually saw masses of people, right? Um, and so the, this was uh, really held up as also being quite inclusive. You can see a record number of 950 riders belonging to 72 different nationalities. Um, and this is constantly something that, that is being reinforced in this inclusive narrative in Qatar to say, look, no, we do include other people and, and broadcasting those, those numbers themselves are evidence that we are inclusive. Um, obviously, we can think of many challenges to that. Um, one of the major challenges to this inclusivist script, though, was a particular event that happened uh, during the event, uh, which I actually only had to figure out quite a bit afterwards. It took quite, quite a while for the full story to come out. But... How I first heard about this was that this this woman was hit uh, by a car when she was riding home after her race. Uh, this was told to me by a Swedish woman who was one of the selfie contest winners. And she told me on great authority, yeah, see, they, there was a person that ran her over because she was wearing shorts. And that was that was her story. That was what she had to say, that, that it was because she was wearing shorts. Obviously, I knew that this person had never been in Qatar before. I knew that this person had a lot of sort of essentialist understandings of how life is in Qatar. Uh, but but she, you know, she was very, very clear about this. She had only heard about this through her home media, though. Um, she did not hear about this, obviously, in, in the Qatari press. Um, but then it eventually sort of comes out, and Hans Falk, who is the Norwegian Cycling Federation uh, president, he finally sort of breaks the silence of it exactly what had happened, which is that uh, it was, in fact, a, a police car that had hit this rider. Um, it's not entirely clear still, I would say, what actually happened. Was it intentional or not? Um, I think if we uh, check the sound on this, uh, if this is, is, do you know if sound works? We can, we can watch his, uh, his account of this if, if we do have sound. <coughs> Beautiful. After this advertisement. <laughs> and it looks pretty good. Well, yeah. About the uh, 30 kilometers per hour, and the car was coming 70 hours uh, per hour, and it just flashed her down. There were no skid marks. Uh, the driver, he was 
not uh, he was walking out from the car. He was the fire cooler, uh, start smoking, uh, talking in the telephone, and uh, Susan was uh, on the on the road. He was screaming, and he didn't uh, he didn't show any empathy at all. So when she was brought with the ambulance, I was talking to several people, uh, and then told me that uh, it's not unusual that a girl with the shorts, the striking shorts, gets hit by the car, but on purpose. I was talking to the Swedish ambassador, and he told me that if you're going to do a police report, then it will be uh, something going on, and then you can leave the country. I talked to UCI about it. We want them to be uh, sure that every rider, especially the, the girls and the women, that they have the team cars behind them. They say that uh, they should do it. But in the morning when the communique comes, we were only telling that uh, we were guests. We have to, to think about that we were guests in Qatar and we have to follow the traffic uh, rules. So I talked again to, to um, to use guy and said that I was really disappointed. We were following the traffic rules. We were behaving like yes. And I also talked to the or organization committee and I should take this case uh, further, but we have never heard anything about it. Using fit desk, under desk cycles and ellipticals. <laughs> In case anybody's feeling like you need some cycling activity. Uh, right, so it, it, I'll, I'll just kind of summarize that in case it wasn't overly clear, but basically there, the police car did hit her. It's not clear at all how or why, um, but as as the um, as the Norwegian cycling director said, he called up the Swedish ambassador, and this was the person that then said, "Well, it was it's it's not unusual that somebody wearing shorts should get hit by a car." I think it might not be unusual that a person might get hit by a car, but I don't think it's because of the shorts personally. Um, so th that is nonetheless then the story that gets told about this event, right? We have no idea um, what was what was behind it, whether the guy just wasn't paying attention and he was talking on his phone, or if there was actual antagonism. It's not entirely clear. But the way that this story started to circulate, and as I said, how I first encountered it was one of the other selfie winners telling me that it was because of this, that these are just intolerant people and they don't like us because we wear shorts in their country. Um, so this this is where I say, like, the, the idea that these geopolitical scripts of we are modern and we're inclusive and we're cosmopolitan <coughs> are being challenged from the bottom up here, right? Um, but then they are also then kind of being perpetuated, uh, the, the Orientalist scripting of this as a kind of backward place that doesn't know how to treat women and you're not allowed to wear shorts and all these sorts of things, while the Qataris are trying to push away from that, that is exactly the story that gets recreated and re-narrated in and through an event like this, right? But the other thing I think that's important about an event like this is that it's completely unpredictable. Nobody knew that something like this was going to happen. It didn't have to happen and every other female cyclist was fine. Right? Um, nothing else like this happened in any other instance. So this is the sort of contingency of these narratives that when that contingency happens, but you're coming up against already these geopolitical scripts and stereotypes that people are bringing with them to the event, there's a big possibility that that just gets perpetuated. And I would say it's kind of the same thing with uh, how the cycling community was reading the emptiness of the streets. Did you have a question? Yeah, she probably recovered okay, but was the policeman a citizen rather than an expat? Yeah, he was a citizen. Um, so, and, and so, uh, right, thank you for reminding me. I didn't explain what, what followed in his, in his commentary, which is specifically that they were told not to file a report because if they did, then they would have trouble leaving the country. And by trouble, that simply means maybe waiting two or three weeks, who knows how long, for it to go through the sort of legal procedures. Uh, so they were being advised from embassy staff and from UCI staff, don't file anything. Your guests, as you heard him kind of talking about, and you should, like, 
the kind of already implying that maybe you were doing something wrong. Um, and so just leave it. It's easier if you just don't file anything. And in fact, as I said, that I couldn't find any news on this in certainly not in the country. Um, and even afterwards, this didn't this report didn't come out until a bit after the event. Um, and you know, very very few people had heard about it when it was actually happening. Uh, so it was it was very much just the idea of try and brush it under the rug. So let's just not let's pretend this didn't happen. Um, so. In, in thinking about uh, these sort of geopolitical encounters then, um, these, the imaging campaign itself, you know, this quote-unquote soft power agenda and this whole set of ideas that the, the organizers are trying to promote uh, was actually really quite challenged on the ground. So we can say that, it's they're, that they're trying to promote a particular story, uh, but that doesn't mean that that story is going to be successful when these events happen. And I think you can already see this if you think about any of the coverage you may have read about the World Cup, that people are already critiquing it for all sorts of reasons. So it's clear that the organizers want to promote this image of modernity and progress and we're open and we're diverse, um, but the immediate reaction from the international press, a lot of it is to say, no, you're not. Yeah. Um, is there any effort by the organizers or the government mm -hmm. to get buy-in from the people, you know, to promote it to their own citizens? Yeah, so... the. There has been for for cycling in particular. They so this is also in the paper. Um, they did they did try to promote having a, a cuttery uh, set of participants in the event. In the end, only one person actually finished one race. Uh, they were supposed to start a female cycling team as well. They hired a Finnish uh, cycling coach to help set that up. It all completely fell apart. Uh, no female entered. Uh, beyond that, then I think the only real sort of effort to get the buy-in from the general, the general population, i.e., the expat population, was through that mass event. Um, and when I was there last year, they actually were doing it again, which which surprised me, I suppose, pleasantly so, uh, that that it wasn't just a one-off, but that they repeated that event. So there there was some extent that that. Um, it, it was promoting that, but of the cycling community that I know in Doha, like people that live there and ride there, it's it's not a, a community that's really able to um, ride safely. Just that's that's the major problem. Um, beyond that, then for some of these critiques about uh, you know the the country and its use of sport, there's. The, the efforts continue, um, but I don't. I think that they're going to have a very hard time convincing the international world or like the international community, the sports community, uh, that there's something fundamentally different about what's happening in Qatari sport simply because um, of, of this this whole set of, of stereotypes that they're coming up against. Uh, that that's much harder to combat, but also the actual challenges on the ground of conducting a sport and doing but a sport. they thought about things like free refreshments to get their own people there. Oh, they, they were doing lots of that. Lots of that, yeah. I mean, it was all, all sorts of give, all sorts of giveaways, all sorts of things, and I didn't talk about this either. There was a way to like get get to the pearl by taking these berries. I've got some other slides of that later. So you, They were trying to encourage it, but no, nobody was going to go. Um, it just, it, the logistics Basically, if you took one of these ferries, for example, from downtown to get to the finish line, it was literally a two-hour trip. I did it several times. <laughs> it was a little frustrating. So you take a ferry, then you get on, like, literally three different golf carts that you had to get, like, shepherded around the island because the golf carts then couldn't go so over the bridges. It was, yeah, it was, it was, yeah. Um, so they, they tried, but it, it was it was not done well. Um, so these these events actually, I think it's, it's, this is an important piece of what we see happening with sport in in this particular part of the world is that they open up these possibilities for these new kinds of encounters um, that are not just shaping this story of who we are as Qataris, uh, who we are as as residents of the country. Uh, so they're they're trying 
trying to use these events to shape up, shape uh, these imaginaries of, of what the country is, but they're also drawing on what those attendees and the participants are bringing with them to Qatar, right? So there's this set of stereotypes and tropes that they're bringing. Um, some of the people I would say that I knew that were from the selfie group, they might have challenged uh, their assumptions about the country, and they really did come to it with a new perception of things. Other people, um, for example, the woman from Sweden went away with just an affirmation that, yeah, they just don't like women that wear shorts and they're going to run us over. Um, <laughs> So these, uh, these sorts of stories, I think, are, are really quite important to actually consider from this question of, of, again, coming back to the people in this story of who's winning, who's losing, um, and when and where. So who within this uh, whole scheme of promoting the World Cycling Championships in, in Doha is winning, who's losing, and, and when and where. So, you know, there's obvious winners in terms of the people who are employed by the Qatar Olympic Committee uh, who are getting salaries from this. And there are also less visible losers in terms of the people who's, um, you know, who's... Uh, who are being more or less excluded from these benefits of uh, the, the amount of money that goes into the pockets of the organizers, uh, that you know, their, their infrastructure for sports is not getting developed within the country. Um, and I think this is something that, that it's really important to consider as we talk about um, World Cup, because one of the major critiques of World Cup in particular is to focus on exactly those workers that are working on the stadiums. And many people have heard about that, but there's there's a much broader set of actors within the country who are getting benefits and are also losing in different ways that is not just a construction worker, right? The construction worker as a sort of exploited figure is a trope within the Gulf. It is not the only person who is relevant to this equation. And I think from my own research in the region and what I tend to focus on, <coughs> on in, in my work in the Arabian Peninsula is those elites. Those people who are winning, right? Because it's, it's one thing to critique the exploitation and the problems of this particular system, but it's another to understand how it is that there are certain actors who are benefiting from this whole set of processes. And this is exactly why I said I had such a dilemma deciding whether or not I should even enter the selfie contest, right? Because the Qatar Olympic Committee put a lot of money into flying me out there, putting me up in the hotel, um, and to putting all of this money to this, that I, I obviously am winning from this event, right? Um, I hope, and as I, you know, I think I saw generally with the with the selfie contest backfiring in so many ways, uh, that these narratives are actually then getting spit back and critiqued of the story that they're trying to tell. So maybe I personally benefit in one particular way, but I would hope that then um, that, that, that I can raise that awareness. And I've given this talk in Qatar, um, so that's good. <laughs> Hopefully uh, raising, raising some awareness and, and they still let me back in. Um, <laughs> But you know, to show that in fact there are there are cost benefit calculus that, that need to be considered uh, beyond just saying this is the cutteries uh, exerting some kind of soft power. Uh, so with that, I will I will leave it there. Um, and Peter Sagan, who was the the men's uh, road race winner, is uh, yeah there there at the center thanking you as well. So. <laughs> so.